Good morning. Happy New Year. And if you're not familiar with this church, I will welcome you to Emmanuel United Methodist Church, aptly named because Emmanuel means God with us. And we believe this morning and every time we gather and wherever we are in the world that God is with us. I'm Gary Shockley. I am a pastor and I'm the supply pastor for today since Mindy and her family have tested for that nasty virus that's still grabbing us around. Um, this is my second time with you and both times were related to COVID. So I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> we're just going to leave it there. But my wife Kim is also going to be helping me this morning as our liturgist. Some announcements that have been scrolling on the screens behind me and in front of you. Um, you've had a chance to see those. Just some quick reminders that there will be no youth group tonight. Um, and the office will be closed to, on Monday. Yes, January the 2nd. I can't believe that we're already talking about 2023. And there are a lot of other good kinds of announcements and information in your bulletin that you'll want to pay attention to as well. Let's turn our thoughts and our hearts to God um, as we join in prayer. Oh God, you made of one family all the nations of the world and by a star in the east revealed to all people him whose name is Emmanuel, God with us. Help us to know your presence with us this morning so that we can proclaim your unsearchable riches so that everyone may come to his light and bow before the brightness of his rising. He who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. A new day has dawned, a new year begun. O Lord, call us that we may hear your voice. The world turns to hopes and dreams of the future. O Lord, keep us in your ways and on your path. We enter this new year with hope and excitement. O Lord, remind us that you lead us. O Lord, guide us as we look to you and worship you. Amen. I'll remain standing as we sing our opening hymn number 240, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Not sure what's supposed to happen now. <laughs> Really? <laughs> I have faith in you. <laughs> okay, you need to be at the microphone then too. Because <laughs> I'm an alto. You don't want to hear me sing that part. <laughs> All right, we're going to do it our best, right? We're in this together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth Glory to the newborn King. 
<laughs> Beautifully. <laughs> Lovely. Let's join in prayer together. Lord of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, we gather here this first Sunday of the new year in a mixture of hope, anticipation, fear, excitement, and expectation. We do not know what the year holds for us. There are things we are afraid of, worries about health and family, job security and finances. There is much to look forward to, weddings or anniversaries or baptisms, holidays to enjoy, friends to laugh with. Lord God, the coming year is full of uncertainty and hope. Whatever the year holds for us, though, we trust you and we place every day of this year into your care, knowing that, as in the past, you are with us, caring for us with constant love. And so, Lord, we place ourselves into your keeping and dedicate our lives to your service through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 38, and I'm reading from the New International Version. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel in the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word today. Amen. Thank you, Kim. So I'm not sure where the tradition started, and it's something that I've just learned about recently, which is to find a word that will become your theme for the coming year, something that will call you to prayer, something that will wrap itself around the way that you live and serve as a follower of Jesus. I like that. So the word that I choose for myself in 2023 is intentionality. The scripture this morning from Luke's gospel for me is a scripture of intentionality. And rather than overwork that in an attempt to get a sermon together quickly, I decided to just tell you three stories of women who have walked in and out of my life with intentionality. So the first woman that I wanna share with you this morning, um, before we get to Anna's story, which will be the third woman, her name was Ruth Heckman. I grew up in the small town of Milton, Delaware, in the southern part of the state. Milton was a shipbuilding town years ago. It's the kind of town that I, I like to think Norman Rockwell would enjoy visiting, and maybe even painting had he had the chance. It's quaint. 
We lived on a street called Pine Street in a Cape Cod style little, little tiny house. Three, three small bedrooms, one bathroom, which we all fought over all the time. And living adjacent to us on our left was the parallel kind of house. It looked identical, owned and lived in by Ruth and Herschel Heckman. Nobody wanted to call him Herschel, so we called him Hecky. So Ruth and Hecky Heckman. Fun people. Hecky worked in a textile mill outside of Milton, and his hours were 3 o'clock in the afternoon until midnight, which meant that Ruth had a lot of time by herself. They had one child, a daughter, who lived near Philadelphia, raising her family. And um, Ruth was alone, but never lonely. And there are some people who can be alone, but not feel lonely, and Ruth was one of them. But Ruth kind of adopted me and my brother and my two sisters as surrogate grandchildren, and so we spent a lot of time in her house. I think nearly every evening, in the early evening, we would go to Ruth's house, and, and she would have the TV on. It was one of those that had doors on the front of it, so you could close the TV off or open it up. Do you remember that? <laughs> I'm old enough to remember that. And we would play Password, and she'd turn the volume way down, and before we could see the Password, she'd close the TV and then open it up, and we would play the game together. Um, and if we weren't doing that, we were playing cards, and she taught us all kinds of cards, like Go Fish and Old Maid and regular kinds of cards. But the cool thing about it is Ruth always made us feel special and welcome. And she went to great lengths to make sure that every experience that we had in her home was one that was fun. I don't know how she did it, but she made sure that each of us, four kids, all won whatever game we played. And then I remember her rifling through her drawers and her cabinets, and she would find things in the drawers that she would give to us as prizes. It could be an ink pen, it could be a really fancy paper clip, <laughs> it could be some hard candy that was sitting in the back of the drawer for a decade, but all of us won. One of my favorite memories of being with Ruth was um, the night that she decided to teach us how to make fudge. And so we were working on this fudge, and we were playing our games, waiting for the fudge to solidify, and it never would. So that night, we had fun and laughter drinking the fudge out of the pan that we had made with her. Now, I knew as a child that Ruth was a churchwoman, but I didn't know much beyond that. She didn't talk much about her faith. She certainly didn't preach Jesus to us. But I could see everything in her actions and behaviors, looking back on her life, spoke volumes about her relationship with the Lord. Ruth was open, she was accepting, she was caring, she was available, she was joy-filled, and she was fun. Not like many of the other adults that I grew up with in that time in my life. And we always knew when we were with Ruth, that we were loved and that we were special, not only to her, but to God. I remember how, help, how heartbroken I was when Ruth told us that she and Hecky were moving closer to their daughter who was going through a divorce and they needed her help. She needed their help. And so um, they moved to an apartment complex. I remember we only visited her one time after that move, and that was when Hecky died very suddenly from an industrial accident. But even in that visit, I remember clearly being in her apartment. And even though it was a sad time and a time of loss and sorrow, Ruth managed to make that day about us. She loved telling knock-knock jokes. And so she had thought of a, a few of them for our arrival. And she would, she would, I would always ask, Ruth, do you know any good jokes? And she would always reply, none beside yourself. <laughs> we played games that day that we visited. She would write to us occasionally after that, especially as I got older. When I was ordained in ministry, she sent a letter written in a fountain pen telling me how proud she was of me, how she could see that in me even as a child. We received another letter from Ruth when we had our firstborn son, when we moved back to our conference after seminary and lived in Potter County, pastoring three churches. That was the last time I had heard from Ruth. 
and our family had lost complete contact with her. I keep the letter that she sent. In fact, I have it on our dresser. I took it out and I decided to leave it there and not lose it. And I read it every now and then to remember this special gift from God. My wife, my wife Kim, um, shared something that she read on Facebook the other day and it made me think of Ruth. It said, Christianity is more of a state of being rather than a status. The Christians shouldn't ask themselves whether they're a Christian or not, but whether they're actually being Christ-like or not. Ruth was Christ-like in the way that she lived and the way that she loved with intentionality. And that helped to shape a lot of who I am today. Hers was a life in faith, steeped in God. So the second woman that I thought of as I was preparing for the sermon this morning was Emma Geiger. Emma was 90 years old when I became a, her pastor at Riverside Church in Harrisburg. I was 18 years old, and for some reason, the annual conference decided to send a child to be the pastor of a city church. Only because I had said to my pastor, I think God might be calling me to ministry, and poof, there I was. I didn't know anything about anything. But I knew nothing about ministry and was about to learn more than I could have ever imagined being there for four years with people like Emma. Emma was the eldest of three sisters who never married. Their father had died when they were young children. Their mother died when Emma was just a teenager. And Emma spent her adolescence and early adulthood and then the rest of her life caring and raising her two siblings. I remember she worked in a dress shop on Market Street. And she was proud of the work that she did there. And with other, whatever meager income she derived from that, she managed to raise her sisters and care for them. She managed to even put one of them through college. And she herself never had an opportunity to do that. So here I am, an 18-year-old pastor in the city church, and I meet Emma Geiger, who is larger than life to me. I could tell from the moment I met her that she had a deep abiding faith. There was something about her that made her special. She exemplified selflessness in every way I could imagine. She and her sisters lived in a small house on 3rd Street, just the opposite corner of where that church was located. And when I met her, one of the sisters had Alzheimer's and the other one was confined to a wheelchair. And even though Emma was older than they were, Emma decided that she would care for them in her home rather than send them to a facility. Well, during my four years at Riverside, I held the funeral services for both of Emma's sisters. And I worried about what was going to happen to this dear soul whose entire life was all about caring for them. With her sisters gone, I remember Emma said to me that she decided she was going to check herself in to a nursing home. Most people would go into that kicking and screaming. Emma said, I think it's the right thing for me to do. Not to have herself taken care of by others, mind you. Emma's goal was to go there to serve the other residents. <laughs> so I'll never forget my first visit to this nursing home because I just had to see Emma. I couldn't find her. She wasn't in the chapel, she wasn't in the cafeteria, she wasn't in her room, and I inquired of people, have you seen a woman about this height, thinner than a pencil, anywhere on the premises? Oh, you must be talking about Emma. She'll be around soon. And not long after I said that, she came whizzing by in the hallway, pushing a wheelchair of another patient, another resident, laughing and talking a mile a minute. <laughs> and every time I saw Emma, that story repeated itself. Every time I saw Emma, she was doing something for someone else. This was the life of Emma Geiger, a woman of deep abiding faith who shared that not so much by preaching at other people, but by showing the love of God in Jesus in incredibly tangible ways. Hers was a life of intentionality. A second woman who impacted this young pastor. 
So the third woman this morning is one that comes to us from the scriptures, a relatively obscure widow woman who's briefly mentioned in the second chapter of Luke. In fact, there's just three simple sentences to tell us her story. So we don't know much, but we know enough. Anna was there in the temple when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus for his circumcision and his day of dedication. We're told that she was a widow, that her husband had died just seven years after their marriage, and she was now 84. We're told that she never left the temple. Now in that day, there was a, an area around the temple for women, for men, and for those who were outside the Jewish faith. But in that temple complex were places to sit and to visit and to talk and to learn. And this is where Anna spent her life. Luke says that she stayed there day and night. I, I get this picture of her like camping there, right? In this place called God's house. And we're told that she worshiped God there with fasting and prayer. That tells us something about her faith, doesn't it? And her love of God and her desire to be with and near and around God. And Luke has such high esteem for this woman from just this little bit that he gives us to know about her that he calls her a prophet, which is one of the highest words of, of honor that you could bestow upon another person in that faith tradition. We usually think of a prophet as someone who can like predict the future, right? But that's the lesser things that prophets were involved in and only really Isaiah and John had that kind of special prophetic ministry. But most of the prophets of God, like Anna, were people who simply spoke and lived on God's behalf. They were God's messengers. And prophets often shared a message of God, not by speaking, but by actually behaving and interacting with people. And in their life, they were able to share the good news of what God was doing. So in verse 38, Luke says, she talked about God, really, she lived about God to everyone who had been waiting for the promised king. I've been blessed in my 65 years of standing upright on this planet to know more people that I could possibly count who have walked in and through my life and could not help but speak God's word and God's truth and God's love and God's presence to me. And when I think about it, most of those folks didn't have to say anything. Nothing could keep them from telling others about Jesus, not so much with their words, but by their actions. It's almost like when you're in the presence of people like that, every pore and every fiber of their being emanates this sense of God's presence. Ever meet anybody like that? Know anybody like that? Maybe you are like that. And a sign is, you wouldn't see that in yourself. <laughs> but others would. And others do. I think the world needs more of those who will reflect and preach the gospel by the way they live. And will only use words when absolutely necessary. So Luke says that Anna was 30, 84 years old. And most women back then married as early as 13. So she could have been widowed from her early 20s. She didn't remarry. We don't know if she had children. Most likely not. I'd like to think because she lived in the temple compound that she had a faith community surrounding her that became her family. But in that time period, a widowed woman had a difficult time of it. She likely had a difficult life and yet she obviously refused to allow her suffering and her own inconveniences to embitter her or to stop her from sharing and showing God's love. And when I think of these three women, these three stories, Ruth and Emma and Anna, I observe their personal suffering and the tragedy that they experienced in life. And I know that 
when we go through those kinds of times in our own lives, we can allow that to bend us in one of two directions. We can allow the hardships and the suffering and the disappointments in life, we can allow them to bend our hearts against God. We can allow them to dim the light that's in us. We can allow those things to hinder us from sharing and showing God's love and even make us bitter and resentful toward God. Whereas I learned from Ruth and Emma and Anna, we can allow the hardships and the challenges that we face in life to make us softer, kinder, more gentle, more understanding, more empathetic, more compassionate toward others, toward God, and even toward ourselves. So how we navigate the end of our life's journey really does depend on how we're living our journey right now. The kind of person we are. The way other people encounter us. Will hardships and suffering and pain and disappointment assault us as they will when they, when they do that? Which way will it bend our hearts? So I want to live my life with intentionality. I want to follow in the footsteps of Ruth and Emma and Anna. I want to be intentional about how I, how I love the people around me, even the people I don't know, even the people who are very different than I am, whose lifestyles are a puzzle to me. I want to love them. I want to be intentional about the relationship that I nurture and develop with God. I want to get closer and closer and closer to God. I want to be intentional about being patient in times of suffering and adversity. I know my wife pays, prays for me about that all the time. Patience. I want to be intentional about being available to people who need me when I have the means and the ability to be helpful. I want to be intentional as a follower of Jesus, not just in what I say or profess to believe. Words are easy but how I live each moment of my rather ordinary life. This I learned from Ruth and Emma and Anna. And I just offer you this morning as we stand here in the new year, the first day, the first few hours, to rethink the intentionality of our lives. How do we want our story to end someday? How will we wish to be remembered by those who met us? We have an opportunity to recommit ourselves to intentionality, to make some healthy, faith-informed decisions and changes that will get us through the storms we face and all the while bend our hearts toward God. I think Ruth and Emma and Anna didn't wake up one day in their 80s and decide to live their life a certain way. A light bulb just didn't dawn on them and change them 100%. That does happen, though. But the ending of their lives had pretty much been determined in the earlier stages of their lives. And because of God's grace, it's never too late for us. Who do you want to be when you grow up? How do you want to be remembered? Whether you're starting at age 84 or 55, or 33, or 18. You can take the intentional steps needed to become that person right now. I learned that from three old ladies who learned that from Jesus. And I'm grateful for a God who loves me, who loves us enough to send us such saints. Amen? Just give you a time of silence to allow this to settle into your heart, into your soul, as you offer yourself to God, and then I will lead us in our time of pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Let us be open to God in these moments.
this new day, this first day in 2023, what a great way to start it, to be here together. To remind ourselves that we are not in this world alone. But God calls us into community where we can see each other and infect each other in a good way with the love and compassion and grace of God. God, thank you for these people here at Emmanuel. Thank you for the light that shines from them, that comes from you. Thank you for the opportunities of this church to be light in the community, to be the Ruths and the Emmas and the Annas that are so desperately needed in a time when the world is struggling so mightily. We know the answer to the world's ills. We know the solution to every war. We know how to eradicate poverty and abuse of migrants. We know how to care for each other. We learn that from you and from the people that you've placed in our lives. So give us the courage, dear God, to be intentional about being your disciples, your emissaries, your presence in the world. That's how the world changes, through us and our willingness to be you. So today, we offer you our hearts again. We offer our total selves with intentionality. And God, as we are here, we bring the ills and troubles and challenges of the world into this place. And even though we feel like we're paralyzed to make any difference, we, we offer you this world of ours and hold it to you in prayer. For the plight of those who are victims, who are abused, who are thought of as less than, who are kept at more than an arm's length, for nations at war with nations. For our country that struggles toward unity. Be with this beautiful world that you created in all its times of crisis. And as I look at the pages in front of me of all the people who are our prayer concerns this morning, Pastor Mindy and Jason and Theo and Jeffrey, but so many others that I see in front of me in this paper that I hold in my hand. God, together we offer you these prayers to these persons that we love and care for, and some are strangers and yet they are family in Christ. Bring the healing that is needed in whatever way to make them whole. We are grateful for you. We are grateful for how much you love us. And we are grateful as a body of Christ that we can unite our hearts and voices in a prayer that you gave to us. Hear us as we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm not sure what the call to action means there, but I think you heard it in the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> check that box we just need to do it <laughs> we just need to act <laughs> and for this next hymn <clears throat> Kim I think it's you and me
<laughs> we have music. Can you join me in, as we stand and sing together and take time to be holy? <laughs> take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing is blessing to see. But I like these words, and we'll use these as our benediction. Make friends of all of God's children, especially help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek for them and for you this day and always. Happy New Year. God bless you, and God bless 2023. <laughs> Go in peace. Christ the Lord.